time to join us today. Um, we will have, I believe, an uh, exciting meeting with great speakers. So it will be a bit complex because we have uh, speakers online, we have speakers in the room, we have some who have slides, some who don't have slides, So, and one who will speak French and I will um, um, manage uh, some translation. But the purpose of this is really to bring us uh, to speed with the concrete reality of one disease in the field and concrete actions of um, in considering preparedness and response. What can we do? What have we not done so well, maybe? What can we do better? Uh, we will have about 30 minutes uh, at the end of the meeting for Q&A discussion with you. Um, and we will have uh, closing remarks uh, on behalf of Dr. Uh, Al Mandari, who is the DG of EMRO. Um, so, with no uh, further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Uh, Kawaya, who comes directly from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he, who is going to speak about the reality of MPOX in the DRC. MPOX is not over in Africa, it's not a, a fake anymore, but it's still happening in Africa. And we will see where the patients are, how they present, what are the specificities. Following this, we will have a, a, um, um, Beatrice Greenstein from Fiocruz, who will reflect on the other aspects of this disease in Brazil. So, Dr. Kawaya, please. Uh, before we start, I'm sorry, we have a video from, uh, as an introduction from our president of Panther um, that I would like us to uh, watch now, please. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends, and welcome to this important site event at the 76th World Health Assembly. My name is Samaso and I'm the president of the entity known as Fanter. I am sorry not to be with you in person, but circumstances prevent me from being in Geneva. Over the next two hours, we will be discussing why I believe this collaboration is so critical to Africa's future. This event is a follow-up to a symposium we held in Kigali a few months ago and will build together on the much needed momentum. We cannot forget what we have been through over the last few years and therefore risk the health of our countries and communities further. We all know that pandemics preparedness has become a more of a priority due to COVID-19 and that there are high level discussion going on. But for the global vision to be a reality, it has to be linked to the ground. There is no global, you are local. Over a recession, we will hear from my colleagues on some case studies, which will show locally developed and built models of preparedness and how we need partners to take on funding to support us to develop these efforts. We really hope that this session will be action-oriented and that you will all live here with ideas to take forward, ideas which can be taken away and developed into something meaningful for your local context. Thank you again for attending this important event. COVID-19 caught us unaware and caused untold damage to global progress towards our goal 
of equitable health for all. In real term, the pandemic led to worsened health equity, which continues to compromise communities' development and progress. We cannot let this happen again, and therefore we must use this peacetime to prepare for any further war against the next pathogen, against the next health threats. Thank you again and wish you a productive event. Thank you, President, and uh, I hope you're online. Um, uh, and I hope you can connect, or you could connect yourself. So, um, cher Dr. Kawaya, est-ce que c'est possible d'avoir la présentation? Euh, je, je donnerai un peu de, de traduction si besoin, mais je pense que la présentation est très explicite en elle-même. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour. <rire> ouais. Oui, euh, je suis Dr Kawaya, comme euh, on me l'a présenté. Je suis chercheur à l'Université de Kinshasa, en République démocratique du Congo. Nous travaillons sur les MPOX et on voulait vous partager la réalité que notre population vit chaque jour et nous-mêmes comme chercheurs et médecins dans ces coins du monde. Alors, euh, alors déjà, pour euh, arriver dans nos sites, il faut du temps, parce que c'est en moyenne euh, 500 km par vol d'oiseau et la route euh, ou les routes pour y accéder est, est très difficile. Donc, par exemple, pour nous, nous avons des sites en République démocratique du Congo, ce qui fait que il faut, quand il faut y aller, ça prend en moyenne beaucoup de temps. Et nous rappelons que lorsque nous allons, c'est pour rencontrer des malades dont la majorité euh, est, âgé, est, est âgé de moins de, de 15 ans. Et aujourd'hui, les taux de létalité pour les MPOX en République démocratique du Congo est plus de 10%. Et voilà donc l'accès, comment il est difficile. Des fois, nous devons euh, marcher sur les rails pour euh, accéder dans ces sites. Ce qui fait que, euh, vu que l'état des routes ne, ne permet pas de, de, de prendre la route ordinaire, nous sommes appelés à marcher sur les rails pour, pour accéder à nos sites. Alors, les investigations sont faites euh, euh, dans nos sites que j'ai cités. Il y en a trois, donc euh, des déjà qui seront, je crois, opérationnels. Et les, les kilomètres, c'est à peu près 900 km par moyenne par vol d'oiseau. Et il faut après prendre des motos, prendre de... de de, de pirogues motorisées pour accéder. Thank you very much. So maybe just to say that, uh, as you have seen, it's very difficult to reach those patients from Kinshasa. It's 900 kilometers, but it's also very far. They need to take motors or they need to take boats. So to access those patients is really already a challenge. Alors, euh, pour mener ces recherches, il faudrait euh, d'abord avoir les consentements de, de, des patients qu'on enrôle. Voilà notre modèle de fiche d'investigation et de consentement. Et c'est là, c'est pour les personnes adultes. Et quand il s'agit des enfants, ce sont les titres qui signent à leur place. So you have seen the, the consent uh, that uh, Dr. Kawaya and his team um, took from patients. Maybe un mot peut-être pour dire que les images sont un peu fortes. Oui. Il faut peut-être prévenir. So maybe to tell the audience that we will yeah. show now and later on some uh, photos that are quite strong, just for you to know. Okay. Voilà, donc, euh, je nous prie de, de voir cette image. C'est vrai, c'est quand même difficile, c'est que forte l'image, mais ça nous rappelle euh, la situation, comment elle est alarmante chez nous. C'est vrai qu'ailleurs, la maladie euh, est déclarée terminée, mais chez nous, c'est... C'est le contraire, c'est le nombre de cas qui s'ajoutent chaque jour. Déjà, ça, c'est un cas d'un enfant de 13 ans qui, 
a partagé la maladie avec ses frères, dont deux sont décédés, ils étaient à quatre. Et lui, euh, on, a, on a pu quand même le, les récupérer. Et vous verrez par après, il y a son jeune frère, son jeune frère qui a fait une très forte, la forme grave de Mpox et que nous n'avons pas pu récupérer malheureusement. Et il y a un jeune, de, toujours dans leur famille, qui l'image, donc la vidéo, je ne peux pas mettre ici parce qu'elle est trop choquante et ça peut éveiller vos sensibilités. C'est pourquoi je vous abstiens de cette vidéo. Et déjà, vous verrez que l'habit que le premier a porté, c'est l'habit que le second a porté pour expliquer comment est-ce que la maladie se transmet du fait de la pauvreté dans laquelle vit cette communauté. Merci beaucoup. I think we need to translate this. So the T-shirt that you saw, the blue T-shirt, was the vehicle for transmission to the other child that you saw later that could not be um, well that Same. passed away, saved, thank you, that passed away, because the transmission is a skin-to-skin -skin, uh, transmission, but here it was transmitted via the t-shirts because they don't have enough money to buy other clothes. Toutes les, toutes les tranches d'âge, donc euh, là, c'est un adulte qui, qui a développé la maladie, mais je tiens à rappeler que des, avant mon arrivée, on a pu avoir dans, nos, dans, dans les aires de santé où nous, nous allons mener ces études quelques cas de MSM. Mais je crois que la situation est, est des mal en plus. Voilà, euh, cet enfant que vous voyez fait, fait, fait partie de la famille. Et lui, on a pu le, le récupérer malheureusement. Il est resté avec euh, cette opacité cornéenne comme séquelle. Voilà, donc euh, c'est l'autre enfant qui lui est décédé. Il a fait la forme grave. On n'a pas pu le réanimer. On n'a pas pu euh, avoir euh, les moyens de le mettre dans une unité de soins intensifs parce que euh, déjà, il n'y a pas assez de moyens pour s'occuper de manière basique euh, des cas. Mais comme lui, il était un cas complexe, donc on l'a perdu. Dommage. So this was a family of uh, four children, two um, passed away, and that little girl of three years of age, I think, could not be saved uh, from the disease. Okay. Donc, la situation épidémiologique, je le disais, elle est euh, euh, préoccupante en République démocratique du Congo, avec euh, plus de 24 zones de santé touchées, et avec euh, plus de 208 cas juste pour la semaine 17. Donc, euh, la situation est très complexe. Et en conclusion, euh, vu que la situation est critique, la place de la recherche est, est en tout cas très importante chez nous en République démocratique du Congo et que tout le monde, nous tous, nous puissions euh, nous liguer pour que, enfin, euh, nous puissions venir en aide à cette population qui, si je me permets les mots, est abandonnée. Merci beaucoup. Thank, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kawaya. You, I think everybody heard the conclusion that you know we need to find solution with research for this abandoned population. So now we're going to move to Brazil. Um, Dr. Beatrice Greenstein works for Fiocruz. She's, uh, she's director there, and she is leading one study called Unity uh, together with other partners that we'll hear from. So um, over to you, Beatrice. I hope it's, everything's working. Me. Can you hear me? Very well. We can hear you and Great. we can see you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So it's my privilege and honor to present in this meeting today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. As uh, Natalie said, uh, I am a physician and researcher based at the Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. That is the largest research institution in Brazil. That's my country, and it's located in Rio de Janeiro. The main campus is located in Rio de Janeiro. So worldwide, Brazil ranks second in number of confirmed cases of uh, monkeypox. Uh, you, can, you can put my second slide, please. I can't see my slides. Okay. Your slides next. are there. Okay, next one, please. 
So Brazil ranks second in number of confirmed cases of Mpox and fourth in number of deaths by May 2023. Most Mpox cases in Brazil were concentrated in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. I am based in Rio de Janeiro, where our institution is located. The first case in the country was diagnosed in, back in June 2022, with the high volume of cases predominantly from July to November, sharply decreasing after that. And currently, we are having around 35 cases uh, oscillating, uh, where uh, and 35 cases were confirmed during the last month. Next one, please. <coughs> By mid 2022, the region of Americas was the epicenter of the new Mpox outbreak, and very few data on the region was available. So we, in a, in a move to address uh, this gap, we compiled data from our cohort of 3,300 back, uh, back then in August, 342 suspected and 208 confirmed Mpox cases that we have seen at the Evandro Chagas National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Fiocruz from June to August last year. Next one, please. We then continued to follow new, part, new patients and uh, I will present you some detail on cases that were seen uh, continuing after, after August until December. So we continue to evaluate suspected and confirmed Mpox cases, and we have enrolled by January this year 818 cases, of which 416 were PCR confirmed. Comparing to non-confirmed non cases, the confirmed cases were more frequent among individuals aged 30 to 39 years, black, cisgender, men who have sex with men, with low schooling, uh, and a uh, very low proportion using HIV pre-exposure <coughs> prophylaxis. STIs, including HIV, were more frequent among confirmed cases, and confirmed cases were more frequently presented with systemic symptoms, more genital and anal lesions, painful, very painful lesions, and proctitis. I will present you in the next slide some of our cases uh, that we, some of the cases that we have seen. So this is the first case I wanted to present you, was an HIV negative cisgender MSM, aged 28 years old, on using uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. He was a previously healthy uh, man and presented with fever, headache, and asthenia, followed by postal post penile lesions and inguinal adenopathy. The penile lesions quickly coalesced into ulcers and he presented balanopostitis and parafimosis. On day 10, he needed urgent uh, urological referral and was submitted to manual reduction of parafimosis <coughs> under the risk of evolving into a neurological obstruction. He later had complete clinical recovery. Next one, please. This is a case of an HIV negative cisgender man who has sex with men, aged 30 years, on also using HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. He presented with clinical features, features of proctitis, as you can see, and had inespecific ulcers in an anoscopy procedure. And only after two days, he developed a single penile lesion. On day seven, the anal pain got much worse, and at the physical exam, he presented enlargement and coalescence of previous ulcers with blood and discharge, as you can see in the photos. He was treated also for co-infection with gonorrhea and recovered about one week later. This is an interesting case because this individual presented internal and pox ulcers, probably highly infectious, but initially not visible, even before having visible skin lesions. This calls the attention to the potential of Mpox transmission in very early infection phases, even in asymptomatic uh, infections. Next one, please. This case occurred in a cisgender man, 52 years old, living with HIV, virologically suppressed, with CD4 cell count higher than 350. 
He initially had an odontological problem that required a dental procedure. After that, he was hospitalized due to a dental abscess. With hospital evasion and posterior readmission with sepsis, respiratory failure, and MPOX classical cutaneous lesions. MPOX was confirmed by PCR in the lesion swabs. It was not clear for us until it until now, if the odontological complaints at the beginning were already related to MPOX. But what happened is that his lesions evolved into a necrotizing, as you can see in the pictures, and disseminated presentation. The team suspected of pioderma granginosum associated and initiated IV immunoglobulin. After that, we were able to get uh, Tecovirimat by the Ministry of Health, our country received only 12 treatments donated by the PAHO, which was initiated uh, uh, at that moment. The lesions were completely resolved one month after tecovirimat initiation, and the patient was referred for plastic surgery. And you can see in the, in the, uh, in the right uh, place in the slides that he had a uh, really full recovery after plastic surgery. Next, next one, please. This slide was for a cisgender man, 32 years old, living with HIV, with very poor adherence to antiretroviral therapy, CD, very low CD4 counts of 24. He attended our service, he reported reporting anal pain and worsening of the cutaneous, mucocutaneous lesions. He presented necrotizing skin lesions, severe anogenital edema, and risk for urological and bowel obstruction. So he also received tec tecovirimat compassionate use by the Ministry of Health, and he reinitiated resumed antiretroviral therapy. So he was referred to surgical support, to a surgical support unit, and developed bowel, bowel obstruction, requiring colostomy and, seps and sepsis occurred due to bacterial translocation. He died due to septic, septic shock, and the medical staff raised the uh, suspicion of immune reconstitution that happened after the ART uh, resumption and the necrotizing uh, presentation of MPOX. Next one, please. This case was a cisgender man, 27 years old, living with HIV, using very irregularly his antiretroviral therapy with very low CD4 cell counts. He presented with progressively worsening MPOX lesions that were already confirmed by PCR with anogenital mucosal involvement, as you can see in the slides, that co coalesced into big ulcers. At hospital admission, he initiated compassive, compassionate tecovirimat use through our unity study, and treatment uh, for bacterial superinfection was also initiated. And he initially recovered well. Uh, and during his hospitalization, uh, antiretroviral therapy was reinitiated, and the patient evolved with worsening again of the lesions after the tecovirimat withdrawal. He presented with recrudescence of the lesions involving palmar and plantar regions, as you can see. Tercovirimat was then reinitiated again uh, by the protocol for a new 14-day cycle, and systemic steroids were also done uh, for potential iris, and with very poor response. We then raised the uh, uh, hypothesis that I uh, iris was the cause of the worsening or tecovirimat resistance. After four months from the initial uh, symptoms onset, he is now very gradually recovering with virological control of his HIV and immunological recovery of his HIV infection. However, he still presents active P um, MPOX lesions with PCR positive with a high burden with CT, uh, <coughs> CT lower than 20, meaning very high uh, virological burden. Next one is my last case. 
And in this slide, we compiled several other clinical presentations of MPOX in our population, such as single maculopapular lesions, isolated oral lesions, isolated ocular involvement, and isolated anogenital lesions, just for you to understand the spectrum of the disease in our setting. And uh, next one, I just wanted to thank you very much for your attention, and I am available for any questions. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, for this uh, <laughs> very strong um, illustration of MPOX not being just a small disease, especially in some populations. So, uh, Dr. Greenstein will not be able to stay for long, so I would st we have planned a Q&A session later on, but if there are questions for her, I think we should give her a chance. So, are they questions? Yes, there is one question there. Just because she cannot stay for the whole meeting. Yes, you. You need a mic? Sure. Hi, thank sorry about that. Hi, thank you. That was fascinating uh, research. Um, my name is Serena Cruz. I'm with an organization called the G4 Alliance, and we advocate for neglected surgical patients. Uh, the question I have is around the patient load and their access chain to the surgery that was needed, especially the patient that needed the plastic surgery and the patient that need, needed the bowel um, uh, surgery. What, from, from what you've shared, that was part of the treatment chain, right? It was part of how to bring recovery for these individuals. But within your health sphere, within your, within your actual ministry and the research that you all do, how is surgery and anesthesia positioned? And how does that positioning bring, uh, bring them in or out of the case management is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, it's a great question. So we fortunately have in Brazil a, an universal access public health system that is unfortunately very, uh, insufficiently funded but uh, in the cases you saw we were able to manage the patients all all of them the all who needed any surgical procedure within our universal access public health system it is not easy but uh, we we were able to manage them in the public health system in many units we sometimes struggle a lot to find a way to put them uh, on uh, to 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 make them have access but in these cases that we presented we were very fortunate including the guy the guy with the that had the necrotizing uh, neck disease that was really really impressive the recovery he had and we were able to refer him to plastic surgery all within the public health system and he is very happy with his new neck unfortunately the guy that needed uh, the bowel uh, surgery he was evolving very it, well he had very very severe disease and the high, highly suspicious of uh, immune reconstitution syndrome after initiating and uh, reinitiating antiretroviral therapy so the situation was out of control with bacterial superinfection i hope i i have helped another quick question because sure. we're yeah please yeah yeah i think we should give you a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I'm Joseph Suvada from Slovak Republic and I would like to know, um, because also topic of uh, the event is global action uh, to cover the needs, have you had organized uh, diagnostics and perhaps whether you calculated uh, average time from symptoms until 
uh, really um, diagnosis was provided. And whether you see any other opportunity for better collaboration, because you mentioned that only certain doses of a specific treatment you have received from uh, global uh, partners. So have you see it uh, from clinical point of view for the future, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you. So what I, I can tell you is that we have access to diagnosis in Brazil through the public health system. It is uh, PCR based. The labs, the labs are all ser that are providing this service are all public public laboratories that were trained and certified. Having said that, we don't receive the, the results immediately. It can take three or four days. Uh, depending on, the, on where you are, it can take uh, up to seven days. So it's not immediate diagnosis, but it is certified and all these laboratories that are part of this network of public laboratories in Brazil were certified. And Fiocruz, where I'm based, has uh, a certified lab that actually certified the other labs in the country. So the diagnostic platform that we have is, is good, although not as fast as we would like it to be. Uh, and, and for your second question, we just received this 12 uh, compassionate use treatment for tecovirimat. What happened is that the, it, the, the surge has decreased and we are not seeing the, uh, many cases anymore. So this is how we are managing it. We now have a clinical trial that is the unity trial that Professor Yazdan will present you. Uh, a bit later on in this in this meeting, and through this trial, we also have access to compassionate use of tecovirimat, but no tecovirimat yeah. through the government whatsoever. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Thank you. I think we, I'd like to ask Dr. Kawaya about the diagnostic access as well on DRC, en anglais ou en français, as as you wish. Uh, okay, uh, about the diagnostic, we have a platform of. Uh, to collect the les échantillons qu'on collecte au oui, niveau des français, ouais. oui les échantillons que nous collectons dans nos différents sites que qui, qui sont dans le pays avec euh, un système avec un système de d'évacuation des échantillons au niveau du laboratoire à Kinshasa le laboratoire euh, l'INRB et on a le professeur Mouyembe qui est en train d'arriver on peut ah, saluer oui. <rire> qui vient d'être célébré Voilà, je peux continuer. Bien sûr. Oui, je, je disais que le système, il est organisé tel que les différents échantillons que nous collectons dans nos sites de recherche sont euh, soit analysés là-bas en amont, mais il y a des examens un peu plus poussés comme les cinq assages qu'on qu est obligé de transférer le, les échantillons à Kinshasa pour, euh, les pour que les analyses soient faites à l'INRB, donc notre laboratoire national. So you're saying that you can do diagnostic at the Kinshasa level that you can do, but you have to share to send the samples to INRB in Kinshasa to do the uh, the, the genomics. I would say, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. that it, it is decentralized, but still, I think centralize everything in INRB about to you, but but centralized at INRB. Yeah. Maybe this is another question we can ask a bit later on time to diagnostic. In, for this disease. So I think we now have to close. We're a little bit late. I apologize to the technical team. I thank uh, Beatrice so much for, I think, your extremely powerful presentation. As Dr. K Kawaya, you will come back on stage later. And I would like to introduce uh, my uh, new Masters of, Cere Masters of Ceremony, Dr. Ogutu, for the next uh, sessions. Um, Dr. Bernard Ogutu uh, is, works at Kemri. Uh, he has a lot of experience in infectious diseases. He's a pediatrician. He knows a lot about uh, clinical research as well. He is also a founding uh, board member of Panther. So now over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you for coming to this session and possibly to share and look at some of the things that we are seeing. And I think this is what we call the endemic pandemics in the south. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that they are there. And I think that's what we really want to share that 
even when we think there are no pandemics, there's lots of them that we need to address and possibly need to see how well to do this as we get prepared for the next pandemic. And with that, we're just going to see how we can get this global action to really meet the local needs. I think the world has been used to structured clinical trials where you can plan and do them in settings where you can move patients to structured systems. But the pandemics call for doing research in where the patients are. You don't, if you move them, then you spread the infection. And I think these are some of the things that we have to deal with the realities of today. If the patients with the Mpox are in the village 900 kilometers away, you are not going to move them. The trials have to happen where they are if we are really going to control the flow and possibly the spread. And that's what we are going to possibly listen to a few of our colleagues to share with us some of the things they're doing in the various areas and possibly I'll start off with Professor Limi Ogaine, who is in Nigeria and also the leader for one of the MPOC study, the MOSA study that is currently going, and also he's the chair for the strategic committee for the unity study. Just uh, welcome him to possibly share with us some of the things that things are happening in Nigeria and what they are doing and how they are able to track and run the studies. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... I want to appreciate the other night. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the slides to come up. Okay, you see my slides now. Sorry, come to my slides. Oh, that's what they're going. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. So I'm talking about um, how we can global actions to meet local needs in emerging outbreaks, the lessons from the global monkeypox outbreak. Um, so I've categorized monkeypox into the old monkeypox virus that causes the old mpox and new monkeypox virus that causes the new mpox. What are old or new? Um, we know possibly that, uh, you can is, uh, uh, do away the video and possibly just talk so that the, okay. the bandwidth is, yeah. Okay. okay. The slide, that's right. I mean, need the slide. So now we have less now. Sorry, we need the slides. <coughs> yeah, the, you can just continue showing the slides, but just. Yeah, really. Can you tell me to unmute? Please. He's muted. You can unmute yourself. Hello, okay. can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, okay, sorry for these uh, little challenges. So I said whether it's old or new monkeypox is uh, caused by double stranded DNA virus, uh, first described in captive monkeys in 1958 in Denmark. Uh, 1970, the first human case was reported in a nine month old boy in the Basankusu district in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, subsequently, in the 1970s to 80s, uh, monkeypox uh, resulted to uh, sporadic disease and outbreaks in most parts of uh, Central and West Africa and became later endemic in these regions. What's also remarkable is that uh, in 2003, uh, clade 2 specifically uh, was exported through animal trade to the U.S., resulting in a cluster of outbreak uh, there. What is peculiar about the old monkeypox virus, which causes the old monkey mpox, is that it was largely a disease that was restricted to rural settings, a disease that was common amongst children and perhaps very young adolescents, and a disease that was largely predominantly a zoonotic related uh, disease in terms of uh, transmission. But there is also the new monkeypox virus that causes the new mpox. 
Uh, apparently, from phylogenetic study, uh, the new monkeypox virus has started in Nigeria in uh, 2016. Uh, but we know that in 2017, we had a resurgence of uh, mpox in Nigeria after a 38 year old gap. Uh, so we had the first case who was an 11 year old boy. And then suddenly we noticed uh, cases across the country. At the end of 2018, about 23 states had reported one or more cases of uh, mpox. But what was unusual about that Nigerian outbreak was that as opposed to prior outbreaks of mpox in Africa, majority of the cases were among young adults, largely males, and there were a number of cases that had unusual genital lesions, as shown here, unusual genital lesions. We also observed at that time, for the first time, that people that had advanced HIV infection tended to have more severe disease and were also more likely to die. Uh, the phylogenetic theory you see here shows that uh, the Nigerian outbreak was caused by the clay 2B strain of the virus. And we have observed that over this last um, 2017 to 2022, there has been remarkable microevolution of the uh, new monkeypox virus. And this microevolution has been attributable to persistence and sustainable human to human transmission of the virus. And that will likely account to why we had a global outbreak in 2022, uh, where close to 90,000 cases have been reported across the globe. And the majority of these cases, uh, in fact, almost, most, almost all the cases, apart from a few, are amongst uh, gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men. Of course, about 50% of the cases are among people living in HIV. And if you look at the type of presentation as, as has been presented from Brazil, you will notice that most of the lesions were focused around the anogenital area. And that uh, is representative of a largely uh, sexual related transmission of monkeypox. So this new monkeypox virus and the new mpox, as opposed to the old mon uh, uh, monkeypox virus, is a condition that uh, occurs mainly in the urban setting amongst young adults and related to sexual contact. If we need to respond to emerging outbreaks, it's important that we take into consideration context. Context is very, very important. And in this case of monkeypox, what is happening in Africa is that we have both the old and the new monkeypox virus, caused by the clade one and clade two. But in the global north, we have the new monkeypox virus. These arrows shows that there's a tendency and a potential for bi-directional spread. So today we have not reported clade one in the global north, but nothing stops that from happening if there's continuous transmission of monkeypox in West Africa and Central Africa. So just to be more specific about how the context is different, I to just give in some differences between mpox in Africa and in global north. Uh, in terms of social demographic, as opposed to the global north where it's mainly young adult males, urban dwellers, in Africa it's both children and young adults, both sexes are affected, and rural and urban dwellers have been shown to be um, affected. Virology, of course, very straightforward, clade one and clade two in Africa. In terms of uh, transmission, we still have significant, substantial animal transmission, especially in Central Africa. We are not too sure about the level of sexual transmission in most parts of Africa. And that's why the risk factors, the, the actual risk factors for monkeypox transmission, especially related to the 2022 outbreak in Africa, is not very clear. With regarding clinical features, uh, monkeypox, most of the cases in Africa, even when sexual related transmissions have been observed, are more generalized. Lesions are more generalized as opposed to um, cases from the global north where they are more localized to the anogenital area. Of course, case fatality is much higher, especially for clade one, than for clade two B. And what is also very remarkable is about the public health response to MP uh, mpox. Uh, in Africa, there are various lacks. Whereas in the global north, we have better funding, more investments, and limited access challenges that I will emphasize in the next slide. So this just to give some of the bottlenecks, context-specific bottlenecks we face in sub-Saharan Africa regarding monkeypox, and it applies to other emerging outbreaks. So we have significant knowledge gaps, limited research capacity, weak public health system, weak public health system. And the knowledge gaps could be related, uh, of course, knowledge gaps with monkeypox is actually very unfortunate. We have had monkeypox for 50 years, and there are so many things we don't know. We don't know the definite animal reservoir. We don't know the definite natural history of monkeypox, the probability of reinfection. 
Uh, we don't know the potential of sexual transmission in Africa. We don't know the efficacy of uh, um, vaccines yet because we are yet to do the studies. There's also limited research capacity, especially as it relates to Africa. Uh, a review of the PubMed publications, for instance, in the last 50 years, you'd be surprised that less than 20% of the publications had African authors as first, uh, first uh, African researchers as first authors. If you look at the 2022 outbreak, for instance, and most of the publications in PubMed, less than 5% of publications are from Africa, and that tells you there's a significant gap in research capacity. And weak public health system is also part of the challenges we face in Africa, and that's also related to funding and investment. And uh, monkeypox emerged in the global north, and we're having thousands of cases. And if you look at 2022, we had less than 2,000 cases reported, confirmed cases in Africa. But that is largely an undercount because a number of the cases in Africa are actually not detected. And uh, Dr. Kawai's uh, presentation in DRC is an illustration of that. There's also issues related to inadequate technology, whether it relates to data sharing, diagnosis, uh, rapid antigen tests, uh, uh, serological tests for uh, monkeypox, uh, whether it relates to development of uh, medical <clears throat> countermeasures. There are significant gaps in Africa. Of course, they are, they are challenged with political leadership. Uh, John Maxwell said uh, that everything rises and falls according to leadership. And we have challenges of political commitment to do the right thing that relates to addressing our health challenges. And uh, our institutions, our systems have challenges of accountability. So the idea of openness, transparency, and the likes is, is a big challenge. And that affects public trust. Uh, because in most parts of Africa and many resource constraints set in, and even in the developed world, there are issues of public trust in the public health system, either because of repeated failures, failures, failures to meet the needs of the and priorities of the of the population, and there are also issues of apathy to public health challenges. For instance, a typical example is the COVID-19 outbreak. When we had the COVID-19 outbreak, Africans were yearning for vaccines. The vaccines did not come. And they survived, a number of them survived. But when the vaccines came, there was apathy. People became uninterested because apparently they felt they could survive uh, um, COVID. And that's the same challenge we are facing with monkeypox. Monkeypox is declining in the global north, and most parts of Africa still do not have, in fact, I believe all parts of Africa, maybe, maybe for research, still do not have therapeutics and vaccines. Health inequity is a challenge that it's always on the table being discussed. And there are challenges of uh, disparities in the whole value chain of health, health development, health processes, and health outcomes that we need to tackle collectively. So what are the imperatives? There's a need for a call for a global action. Monkeypox has been a neglected disease for many years. 50 years we have had monkeypox, and it's really unfortunate that it's just recently that we are developing vaccines and therapeutics. And we should recognize that because infectious pathogens have no borders, we are like a chain, we are all connected, and we are as strong as the weakest, weakest link. So it's a time for us to invest. We should not allow history to repeat itself. Mon monkeypox must not be neglected again. And if we do not work collaboratively and cooperatively and take global action to address this challenge of monkeypox. We should understand that nobody is safe until we are all safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it is a pleasure to know that the monkeypox is not the same across the globe. And it looks like it is going to behave different in different settings and in different comorbidities that are likely to happen and i think that's what you have seen and as much as there's under reporting from some of the regions that we know so i think the next speaker is going to possibly tell us much about the unity study and this is professor yasdorf who has several hearts but also is the vice president of panther yes welcome and share with us some of the intricacies that you are dealing with in trying to make monkeypox a disease to discuss and to be at the table. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks uh, for your nice introduction and uh, 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 thanks for the invitation. I don't know if I can have my slides uh, if possible. 
It will be great. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, what I have been asked to talk is about the um, the uh, actually the need for the collaborative rapid multilateral research response during the epidemic and to, to talk about the case of uh, monkeypox. Next slide. Um, and uh, mm, so you know that, uh, oh, I don't know what is, uh, why we have this title, but anyway, previous output, you should not took that to the, to the, uh, to, uh, to the title, but anyway, uh, previous outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics have shown, as you have seen for COVID-19, that clinical research response effort are delayed and fragmented uh, during a pandemic or during an epidemic, failing to enroll a sufficient number of patients. Um, and for example, for COVID-19, most of the early research responses were initiated at only the national and regional level, and few trials were set in low-income countries. Next slide. Uh, so, mm, mm, uh, this is slide is just to, to, to show the the general and pox context, uh, and to see how and whether we had improved in setting up uh, collaborative research or not. So, you know the dates, you know uh, that uh, monkeypox was uh, uh, declared by WHO as a fake, you know the number of cases, uh, you heard from Beatrice, from Demi uh, uh, about the, the outbreak, what I want to emphasize is on what you can see on the um, bottom of the slide um, uh, is that uh, there is, in this context, a real need for cooperation, inclusiveness, uh, uh, capitalizing on the diversity of the expertise uh, for the benefit of all the affected population, and also the fact that there may be the disease is not always the same at all the region as it was explained to you already. Next slide. So we uh, tried uh, to build uh, actually a new uh, uh, um, model of clinical trial, uh, which is the unity study. And probably, although there are still some negative points, I think we did some uh, uh, progress. So unity study that actually uh, Beatrice uh, already uh, uh, stated is a um, study uh, which uh, in primary investigators of Professor Kalmi from Geneva and Professor Greenstein from uh, 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 Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's a phase three multi-country randomized controlled trial uh, to assess the efficacy and safety of one of the most promising drugs in this area, which is the tercovirimab. So I think that one of the main uh, um, uh, positive points here was that uh, very early, based on a trial that was already uh, uh, actually uh, um, planned, but not started before the epidemic by ENRB, so the National Institute of uh, 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 Infectious Diseases in Kinshasa, headed by Prof. Muyembe and NIH, they had already designed the trial. So based on this trial, WHO, uh, uh, with the help of INRS, actually, and all the researchers, uh, uh, tried and succeeded to construct a WHO core protocol. And this was very important. So, based on this code protocol that was um, uh, focusing on tecovirimab in a specific population with the primary objective of evaluating clinical efficacy with a specific primary endpoint, uh, several studies were built, among which the UNITY studies. Next slide. And uh, uh, Basically, we tried to have within this study a multi-level governance system at the international level. A global governance where each individual country or region sponsor and implement the clinical trial 
under the umbrella of a common governance that uh, was coordinated by NRS with a global coordination, a global data statistic and data management, a common DSMB, a common safety pharmacovigilance, and working groups to, dif to discuss different aspects. And within this global, there was a local governance where uh, uh, the protocol could be adapted um, and the study operation implementation could be adapted. Funding was funded by each of the, uh, uh, the countries. Uh, uh, there was the ethical committee submission, the insurance, and the data monitoring. So there was a, the fact that the countries could be independent, but there was a global coordination. Next slide. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this was within a larger consortium, which was MPOC's response, which was funded by the by, by, uh, European Union, where you had unity, but also a part of the uh, study that was focused on Europe, epoxy, and a part of the study that was uh, uh, in Africa, which is MOSA. Uh, and the idea was, again, to use the same core protocol with close collaboration on data repository, data management, representativeness in a global governance, a shared SMB, as you see here to try actually to leave to each region or country its independence but also have this global uh, government experience uh, 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 and this is actually now discussed in a paper coming out in uh, nature uh, medicine of course everything was not simple we had in particular difficulties to start because of the delay of the authorizations, but we have started, I will show you afterward. And also we had some funding issues that were not easy, but again, we have this funding from Europe. And what was interesting is that given that the study, the, the three studies were, were funded, but given that the, there were no cases in Europe, European Commission is normally accepting that some of the money that was for Europe goes to Africa and to Latin America, which I think it's also very important. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I just wanted to say, uh, because I don't know why it has disappeared before this slide, that currently in UNITY, we have more than 30 uh, participants enrolled. This is uh, specific, especially uh, in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, uh, where the epidemic is still occurring, and thanks to Beatrice Christine team uh, uh, efforts, uh, which are huge, and uh, uh, we are now going to also start in Argentina, in Latin America. Uh, but there is not only this, this uh, uh, studies. There are other studies. Uh, Stump, which is in the USA uh, by ACTGD, Platinum in UK. Uh, there's also Platinum uh, uh, Canada. And uh, so I think the fact that there were several studies, that's the way it is, good or bad. But what at least we did at the initiative of the UK researchers is that the fact that the, the, the WHO core protocol was used was very important because uh, now we can uh, uh, merge all the uh, data and there is a uh, uh, the idea of the individual patient-based uh, meta-analysis uh, for reaching the final objective of a quicker and stronger answer on this drug, tecomirimat, efficacy. And it involves all the clinical trials, everyone agrees. So, and, and you can see that each of the, the studies have only few patients enrolled because the epidemic went down, but what we can do at least is that we can maybe with this meta-analysis to have quicker answers. So you can see there were still some issues, funding issues, the fact that we started early, we should have we couldn't start early. We I think we are still too slow to stop, but at least the fact that we have the same protocol to work together to try to do this meta-analysis or at least a step forward. So I just wanted to, to present this as an example. We have still many, many uh, 
uh, uh, progresses to do, but we are progressing. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for sharing with us, and I know he's, you're not going to be with us for long, and I think this just explains what, how some important interventions and possibly networks struggle to get very clear answers for a very major global problem. And I think this is what the unity study possibly exposes to what is happening despite having gone through a pandemic. Still, we have not learned very well. And there's something burning that you'd want to know from Yesdo. I think we might release him because I think he'll not be with us during the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, and I think we'll possibly go to our next presenter, Marie Espard, who is going to possibly tell us some of the networks and the few things that they are doing and bringing in two different platforms to get some work done, and also tell us some of the issues they are facing with in this landscape. Welcome. So thank you very much. I don't know if I will have my presentation. I will not be able to present the presentation of Mimi. So please, <laughs> can I have mine, if it's possible? Oh, we switched. I don't know. No? Hmm. Why don't we ask Mimi to start? Oh, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was. All right, possibly is to welcome Mimi. Just come. Uh, she's, uh, she's one of the strong ladies of Africa, leading one of the best and possibly formidable regulatory authorities on the continent uh, in Ghana, and shepherding quite a number of regulatory authorities as well. And Ghana has always been there, and I think there's, there are the people who do the unique things in the continent. They are the first country to name a public health institute after a local researcher to, to celebrate, yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's me, me, no. So we might let her tell us some of the things that possibly, she, from a regulator's point of view, what happens in this landscape. She's not having slides, okay? Yes. Welcome. Okay, so I'm not telling my latest point of view, so. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think I'm probably talking about um, Averif. Yes, okay, so uh, thank you very much. So I'm here to talk about Averif, and I chair the um, steering committee of the African Vaccines Regulatory Forum. So that is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the AVRF is um, uh, a regulatory forum that is made up of uh, national regulatory authorities on the continent, ethics committees. And we are supported by the um, WHO Africa region as a secretariat. And we are also supported by um, NRAs who have referenced what we call the reference NRAs who have taken part in maybe the early phase trials that we would be discussing. And we are also supported by partners like uh, Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation, Welcome Trust, um, Auda Nepad, and maybe USFDA. Now, the good thing about AVRF is that it allows um, sponsors to submit applications um, for protocols to us to multiple countries and have those protocols reviewed um, jointly by countries. And um, what it does is that it allows us to, um, for protocols to be optimized um, so that we, we are able to review the protocols in a timely manner. And we, this, th this effect was felt especially during uh, uh, COVID. I mean, we felt this during Ebola, but Ebola, Ebola did not affect the entire world. But during COVID, for example, most of the, the COVID medicines that we, COVID vaccines that we all um, um, authorized was done by joint review. So within a short time, most of us reviewed all the, all the COVID vaccines for most of us and, and in a very timely matter, manner. 
um, with the AVREF uh, um, um, processes, all the countries use the same, have adopted the same guidelines, have adopted the same um, format. So if you go onto all the AVREF members' um, websites, you find out that we are using the same guidelines for joint review, we are using the same guidelines for clinical review, we are using the same guidelines for GCP, and if you apply for a joint review, you can have it done in a short time. We now have joint reviews for emergencies, we have joint reviews for pandemics, and if you apply to AVREF, you will get your, your, your um, protocol reviewed in a short time. We also have um, a system where you can get an approval for a product that, that you want um, um, approved. It also provides better clarity for, for um, sponsors that want to um, 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 use a national process. The good thing about ABREF is that it brings, we know that when you go into a country to, to um, submit a protocol, you have to deal with the ethics committee, you have to deal with the regulator, we don't work together in countries. I mean, even in Ghana, where we have semi-good systems, we don't work with our ethics committees. So recently, we had um, a, a system where we, we tried to sit together with uh, ethics. It was a bit of a nightmare. But what the, the, the AVREF has allowed us to do is that we are now speaking to each other. So we now have, within all our countries, we now have um, a challenge where we are trying to, 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 to draft an MOU between ethics and, um, and regulatory, where we're saying that we will have an MOU between us in each of our countries where we will agree to work within a certain timeline using um, the AVREF um, system. So if you, if you apply to AVREF, then the, the regulator and the ethics will agree to submit an application um, and agree to work within a certain timeline so that there is um, a, 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 what you call a parallel submission can be made and the sponsor can agree or the sponsor can be assured that within that timeline, once they've submitted an application in a parallel manner, they can get the application reviewed within that time and we have both signed that MOU. That is a process that has just started and we have, um, it is just, it started maybe about three or four months ago. We have committed to that process and um, we are hoping that within the next couple or so months, we will all sign, all the countries are encouraged to sign it so that when there's a parallel submission, ethics and NRAs will work together to ensure that when you submit a protocol, it will be done within that, within that time. But at least the, 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 the goodwill is there. Um, Sustainability is one of the challenges that we have. We can't have partners funding everything that we do. So there's going to be some um, um, cost that will come to um, sponsors of applications. And we hope that you will agree to pay those uh, little sums of money so that we can ensure that that process continues. When, the, when that happens, we'll come to you for that, uh, that amount. But um, the beauty of um, the average process is that um, it is a learning process every day. So each AVREF meeting that we go to, the smaller countries or the weaker NRAs have, uh, it is a learning process. We have webinars where um, countries are developing themselves all the time. So they will not take as long as they do um, to review an application. And um, it is a learning process for us. A lot of work has gone into it. But the good thing about it is that the, the systems are harmonized, the guidelines are harmonized, and we get better at it all the time. Before, it used to take countries sometimes 300 days to review an application. Now we are all down to roughly about, actually, some of the smaller ones are doing it even faster. We are down to about um, 30 days to review an application, and we're getting even closer. So all in all, we're getting there. Once we sign these MOUs, I think we should be there. So in a nutshell, that is what I have to say about Avref. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there are going to be fairly many questions about Avref. And I think we shall them for the next. And now it's your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, I rather discuss with you about LASAs and AVAREF, so I'm glad to have the, the good uh, presentation. Thank you very much. 
so I think we'll change a bit the disease. We have talked about monkeypox. Now we will discuss a bit about Lassa fever. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, it's me. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> sorry. And yeah, okay. I can see something here. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so sorry, sorry for this. Okay, so maybe all of you are not familiar with Lassa fever, but it's a, a Lassa virus uh, in the family of Arena viruses, and it's responsible of um, viral hemorrhagic fever. WHO estimates that more than uh, 5,000 cases uh, died per year in West Africa mainly. The reservoir is the small rats who, who defecate or urinate in the, in the houses of, of people, uh, mainly in West Africa, uh, and who is responsible of the spread of the disease. And then you have also human-to-human uh, -human transmission. The most affected country actually is Nigeria. Uh, where we can count uh, almost 1,000 patients uh, per year. And I've been working with a French NGO named Alima since uh, 2017 on Lassa fever in Nigeria, where we have set up a medical uh, center for Lassa fever. You can see picture in this, in this slide. You can see that we are uh, performing dialysis, that we are treating patients, and also that we uh, worked on the laboratory in order to do diagnostics. We have set up the LASA, the LASCOP cohort, which is a prospective uh, LASA virus cohort. And we have identified in a prospective way a mortality of 13%, which was not totally uh, known at that time. We have uh, found out that the, maybe most of the patient, and all of the patients, sorry, uh, receive ribavirin for the treatment of LASA fever. And some patients, 8%, had uh, access to dialysis uh, in this cohort. For the patients who have been having dialysis, most of the, uh, uh, half, sorry, half of the patient died uh, in the follow-up of those patients. The prognostic factor were age, over 35, CT value, of course, like as usual, news 2 which is um, a clinical score uh, evaluated at admission of the patient, KDGO score, which is uh, a way to evaluate uh, kidney injury and ALT uh, level. Whereas, whereas we have uh, been given ribavirin, some questions have been raised on efficacy of ribavirin. Uh, many of our colleagues, researchers from UK and Germany, uh, identify uh, lack in the data available on the ribavirin efficacy. So there is a big uh, there is an important need for therapeutic option, new ones, such as the ones that are listed here and that I will uh, present to you. So, based on all this uh, information we gather with LASCOP study, we set up the integrated project. Uh, when I say we, it's a large consortium, as you can see here. There are all the, all the partners of the consortium in this slide. So, 15 partners, North and South uh, institution. And this uh, consortium has been, have been built on 15 years collaboration. Not all the partners are working together since, since 15 years, but at least there are collaboration between us and Nigeria, us meaning uh, Alima and University of Bordeaux, between our colleagues in Germany and Nigeria also, between uh, um, North Carolina University and colleagues in Liberia. So all, all these partnerships have been set up in this consortium in order to try to find treatment, effective treatment for Lassa fever. This consortium have already uh, organized and, and finalized, finalized a safari the SAFARI trial, which is a phase two study on safety for favipiravir evaluation. Data will come shortly, hopefully. And now we have set up the integrated study, uh, which is a platform, adaptive platform a randomized uh, phase two, three control, of course, uh, in West Africa to evaluate new, new drugs or repurposed drugs uh, against Lassa virus. The control arm will be ribavirin because it's a standard uh, treatment. And the first drug we will evaluate will be favipiravir. We plan to include all uh, patients uh, with all ages with Lassa virus uh, confirmed infection. 
of course, we have. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. So you don't see, but there is this nice woman who just raised a paper saying that you have only two re two minutes remaining. So it's a bit uh, strange. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is funded by uh, European Commission and by ANRS, of course. And uh, what is important in this study is that we have a drug prioritization board aiming at evaluate what new drug can be included or not in the in the study. Within this integrated project, and this is what we are doing in, partner, in partnership with Panther, is that site preparedness program, because we have two main sites in the integrated study, which are two sites in, in South Nigeria, Owo and Iroa site, which are, are mostly ready for the trial. And we plan to uh, have more sites included in the trial. And those sites are actually named satellite sites and are listed in the, in the map in this slide. So you can see sites in Guinea, in Liberia, in Benin, and a new, another site in Nigeria. And the, the aim of this program is to prepare those six sites uh, for the inclusion in, in the next, uh, in the integrated study. So what, what did we do? First, we uh, select six sites that are uh, interesting in terms of epidemiology of Lassa fever. We send a questionnaire to all the sites to evaluate their capacity. And then we, not me, but uh, Nathalie here, you can see a, uh, a photograph of Nathalie in this slide in uh, Liberia with, with our colleague, uh, Billy Fisher and Beatrice Serra. So my colleagues uh, went to each site to eva do the evaluation, to discuss with the sites, to, to see what are the needs in terms of uh, capac capacity strengthening. We then uh, edit the capacity threatening plan that need to be implemented in the coming months uh, and which will be done before the end of this year. The capacity threatening plan uh, include training uh, needs in terms of patient care, GCP, GLP, and other needs. Of course, also equipment. You've seen that dialysis is important in Lassa fever, so we, we plan to, to, to set up dialysis in, in, in uh, sites that need it oxygen concentrator and, and lab laboratory device and other items. Of course, all, as usual, issues with energy and waste and water sanitation. All this is evaluated by the plan. And thanks to this plan and to the implementation of the capacity strengthening, we will, we will be able to uh, raise those satellite sites to study sites for at least for integrated study. And those sites will be ready early 2024 if everything goes well. So, Lassa fever is, is here just an example. Uh, we have been working on disease for several years, but we think that all we uh, have learned and all that we will learn in the coming uh, years will be helpful for other diseases. I don't know what you think, but for me, I think the next disease the next disease will be, the next outbreak and the disease X might be a viral disease because we have seen in the past year that uh, COVID, monkeypox, Ebola, Marburg, influenza, missile, all the diseases have emerged or re-emerged or cause uh, outbreaks in, uh, in the world and all the diseases are viral disease. So we really think that it's important to move forward on the clinical research on drug dedicated on virus, so antiviral, antiviral drugs. From the integrated study, we'll be able to gather some information on the antiviral drugs we will evaluate, we will be evaluating, sorry. So like favipiravir as the first one, but other drugs, and also information on drug association. We really think that as for other virus well known, we will we might need um, drug association for those diseases. And so this is some questions that we might be able to answer with integrated protocol. We'll gather information on safety, on PK, on PD. Um, and on the use of those drugs on vulnerable populations such as pregnant women and children. And of course, with the site preparedness program, uh, we will be able to build capacity on sites and then to, to be able to uh, respond to new outbreak in terms of um, clinical management of patients first and also clinical research. And here you can see some examples. The first one and the only one I will discuss is the Ebola virus disease that I, I work um, on for several years also. So you know that there is a treatment based on monoclonal antibody who have been validated in the last outbreak, in one of the last outbreak in, in DRC. Uh, this works very well and it's a, it's a very interesting drug, but its, it's efficacy is a bit low on severe patients. And those drugs are not available to clear the reservoir of the patient. 
So we think that we need to have drug combination for Ebola virus, and we need to associate antiviral drug. So again, back to antiviral drug, and, and we think the, re the response is probably with both drugs. So Ebola is just an example, but for the next outbreak, for the disease X, uh, all those steps on antiviral uh, drug uh, knowledge might be useful. So in conclusion, very quick, uh, LASA fever treatment is under evaluation in the trial I've just described, and we will submit to AVARF uh, this, uh, this protocol in the coming weeks. Uh, we have been prepare, preparing uh, six sites in West Africa for medical care on viral hemorrhagic fever and uh, clinical research in collaboration with Panther. And we think that uh, antiviral treatment research is really important to take care of the next outbreak. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, you can see there's still more work to be done on what we might not see as pandemics, but they are existing and causing more problems. And there's no better person to possibly talk about some of these things. He's been the, in the trenches for f fairly a long time dealing with these viruses. And uh, it's none other than Prof. Miembe to say a word. Monkeypox, Ebola, Lassa. Bon, heureusement, euh, dans mon pays, euh, la euh, République démocratique du Congo, Lassa n'existe pas. Pas encore. <rire> bon, voilà. Et c'est surtout donc euh, Ebola et Monkeypox. Alors, Monkeypox, je pense, c'est une vieille maladie qui était confondue avec euh, la variole. Et le fait de vacciner contre la variole, on protégeait contre le monkeypox. Et lorsque la variole a été éradiquée et on a arrêté la vaccination, le monkeypox a apparu. C'est l'héritage que nous laisse l'éradication de la variole. Je pense, parce qu'à l'époque, euh, surtout en Afrique, il y avait deux formes de, de variole. Il y avait la, la variole grave et la variole euh, modérée qu'on appelait à la stream. À la stream. Et peut-être à la stream, c'était confondu avec le monkeypox. Et donc, chez nous, le monkeypox vient d'abord, n'est-ce pas, de l'animal, du réservoir et attaque surtout les enfants. Attaque surtout les enfants. Et euh, les enfants malades vont donc infecter la famille et les ménages. Après, donc, c'est la transmission de personne à personne. Nous n'avons pas vu de cas euh, dans la sphère euh, sexuelle, quoi. Nous n'avons pas vu. Et euh, maintenant, avec ce que nous voyons à l'Afrique de, de l'Ouest, pour nous, c'est quelque chose donc de nouveau. Et le monkeypox a attiré notre attention dès 1980. Bon, donc le premier cas, c'est en 70. En 80, l'OMS a mis en place un système de surveillance euh, active parce qu'on craignait que le monkeypox puisse prendre la niche laissée par euh, la variole et, et donc euh, abîmer tous les bénéfices que nous avons obtenus par le programme mondial de l'éradication de la variole. Mais après, donc, pardon Est-ce que je peux essayer de traduire Je vais oublier après. Ah, ok. okay. Oh, je croyais que je non, croyais qu à Genève, on parlait français. <rire> <rire> ok, ok. Just two minutes, because I think yeah. it's so important. So I think you're saying that uh, uh, MPOX is an old, an old disease, which might have been misdiagnosed at the time where you had the two different forms of uh, smallpox, but then it... For me, for me. Yes, that's yes. what you're saying, yes. and that it reappeared when smallpox was eradicated, and it's 
um, now coming up again yeah. uh, because of the interruption of the vaccination uh, against smallpox, that it's an animal uh, transmitted disease, and uh, that it um, then just continue, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Donc, um, uh, nous avons mené des études, les premières études, qui ont montré que le monkeypox n'était pas un danger pour le programme de réactivation de la variole. Mais dix euh, ans plus tard, nous avons mené également des études qui ont montré que le nombre de cas de monkeypox ne fait qu'augmenter, et c'est même 20 fois plus que ce qu'on voyait au départ. Donc c'est devenu un problème de santé publique. So now you have seen that uh, since 10 years that it's increasing, it's been increasing 20 times more, I think you said, than before, and it's really, it became a public health problem of, uh, of concern, at least for the DRC. Oui. Donc le nombre de cas ne faisait qu'augmenter, et notre grand problème, c'était les diagnostics. Pour les diagnostics, nous devions parfois prendre les échantillons, envoyer ça en Allemagne, ou bien envoyer au CDC à 30 ans. So the problem was mainly diagnostic. At that time, they had to send sometimes the samples in Germany and then from Germany to CDC Atlanta. Mais euh, maintenant, nous maîtrisons complètement les diagnostics de monkeypox jusqu'au séquençage et euh, nous le faisons localement, d'abord à l'INRB et maintenant c'est décentralisé dans les provinces. Yes, and this is what also Dr. Kawaya said, that now you're doing decentralized diagnostic, including now uh, sequencing. Oui. Et les études actuelles que nous faisons, c'est uh, des études clin uh, essais cliniques avec des covirumat que nous menons dans deux sites, au Maniema, à Tunda, et uh, au Sankourou, à Kolé. So, and now uh, uh, there is a study called PARM007 that uh, is uh, done in the DRC in two sites, in Maniema and Sankuhu province. Yeah. Uh, voilà, je crois que tout le monde attend les résultats de ces, de ces essais cliniques parce que uh, le Congo est le pays le plus affecté par uh, le monkeypox et nous ne manquerons pas de cas pour continuer notre essai clinique. Oh, yes. So now we're all waiting for the results of the Tecovirimat study. Yeah, because, because the DRC is the most affected country, uh, so uh, we will not lack uh, cases of monkeypox to continue our study, our clinical trial in the field. Thank you. I, I think uh, we, we should thank you for, your, for, for, for this update. <laughs> um, It, it's a nice, uh, it's really important to have your, your views on this. And I think you also have uh, to leave soon. So we have Prof Muyembe here. As you know, he's just been acknowledged and recognized by Dr. Tedros for his, all his achievements uh, in the past. So if there are burning questions, I think uh, I'm sorry again for the organizers, but if there are questions for Prof Muyembe, please uh, share them with him now. And I'm sorry as well because it seems that online people cannot see you because you're standing uh, oh, here and you're not sitting there, but that's, you know. Okay. But maybe if there are burning questions, mm. uh, please, from the audience. Yes. Ah, yes, there is. Suri. Okay. Merci beaucoup, je, je vais essayer de m'exprimer en français. Euh, D'abord, félici félicitations pour euh, tous euh, tout les euh, grands euh, accomplishments, <rire> je ne sais pas le mot en français, euh, de toute votre carrière. Euh, J'ai une question sur le, le changement de culture de, de, de euh, euh, collaboration internationale dans le domaine de la recherche scientifique qui a eu euh, récemment, euh, je pense, beaucoup d'attention sur le, le concept de la décolonisation, euh, d'avoir euh, plus d'équité de, de, euh, entre les, les chercheurs dans le euh, nord et le sud. Euh, moi, je, je pense que vous, avez été, vous étiez vraiment un, euh, un grand leader, quelqu'un qui, euh, euh, le, le, euh, qui a défendu le, les droits de chercheurs euh, dans euh, les pays en, en développement. Donc, est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a eu un, vraiment un changement qui, que la, la nature des collaborations internationales dans le domaine scientifique, ils ont euh, devenu plus euh, égales, plus, euh, plus euh, équitables euh, 
Voilà, c'est ça la question. Oui, bon, c'est très délicat. Je, je, euh, je comprends. So, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, pardon, mais do you want to translate your question in English? No? Oh. <laughs> Because we have, we have uh, English speakers. My, my question is very simple. It's, yeah. it's have uh, international research collaborations become more equitable over time? Because Professor Mwembe has been a, a, you know, he's a, a star and a leader in this field. He's worked for many decades. He's seen it all. <laughs> so have things changed? And my answer also is very simple. Because, because I think at that time, we have no, uh, no uh, critical mass of researchers. For example, in my in institute, I was the only PhD at that time. But now, we are 27. So the critical mass is very important to conduct research locally and to have the leadership, yes. I think uh, for the moment we have no, no problem with our partners. And we decided in my institute not to send sample out, uh, abroad, outside the country. We must do everything locally because we have all the equipment you can have here in, uh, in Geneva or uh, in Louvain, we have the same equipment. So uh, we are performing, we process all samples locally and not uh, to export uh, these dangerous uh, uh, samples to Europe or to uh, America. <laughs> it is too, too dangerous and we prefer to do everything locally. Yes. And, but the, par the partnership are very, uh, are very strong, are very strong. And it's a bit gagnant-gagnant, win-win. This is very important. OK. Yes, there's another question. Maybe, Prof, do you want to say? Merci beaucoup. Passer par là, parce que je veux mieux te dire. Tu vas, comme ça, tout le monde va te voir. Beaucoup mieux. Oui. OK. Alima. Voilà. Oui, OK. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais dire... Ma joie de voir le professeur Moyembe. Je suis professeur Beignet. Je suis enseignant, chercheur, je suis directeur de, euh, de, de, de l'Institut national d'hygiène publique à Abidjan. Je sais qu'à la faveur d'Ebola, on a une équipe de RDC qui est venue nous appuyer pour, préparer, pour nous préparer éventuellement à une euh, épidémie. Et vraiment, ça a été une belle expérience à l'époque. Je reviens pour dire que le Congo, la, la RDC, est un véritable laboratoire, vous l'avez dit pratiquement, pour toutes ces maladies à potentiel épidémique. Et je retiens que aujourd'hui, vous avez beaucoup d'expérience. Je pense que ça sert énormément. Et avec le développement du laboratoire, ça a énormément servi pour euh, la réaction prompte, la preuve. Les cas de boulot qu'on a maintenant, c'est des cas qui sont gérés en si peu de temps. Pour en revenir à euh, comment on appelle ça, le, le manque poste. Le manque poste, les cas que nous, nous avons, les cas suspects que nous avons eus, c'était des enfants, vous l'avez très, très bien dit, mais il y avait un, un rapport avec les rongeurs, parce que c'est les enfants qui sont souvent en contact avec les rongeurs. Est-ce que ça a été la même situation chez vous oui. Deuxièmement, je voudrais demander, et ça c'est peut-être au docteur que je vais demander, euh, est-ce que ces enfants-là, dans la surveillance, est-ce que vous avez pu établir les contacts avec les autres Parce que dans le suivi des contacts, c'est vraiment une stratégie importante pour pouvoir arrêter la, la dissémination de la maladie. Qu quelle a été le, la stratégie de suivi des contacts pour qu'on puisse arrêter Ou bien c'est resté localisé au niveau des familles Parce qu'on sait que souvent dans certains campements, dans certains groupes, quand les gens sont dans la forêt, ils vivent entre eux. Et ça favorise quand même le fait qu'on peut, euh, peut facilement canaliser la maladie. Est-ce que ça a été la même situation au Congo Merci. J'en ai fini. Je, merci beaucoup. Juste, je n'ai pas entendu de quel pays vous, a, vous parliez. Excuse Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire. Oui, Côte d'Ivoire. Okay, oui, oui. The, the question was from 
Côte d'Ivoire. We from Côte d'Ivoire. We thank uh, Prof Muyembe for the training he has provided with the NRB for the diagnostic of uh, many diseases. And now coming back, je fais, je fais court, hein? mm -hmm. coming back to MPOX mm -hmm. to ask uh, how you manage uh, contacts and follow up of the environment of the other mm -hmm. uh, uh, surveillance of the other contacts. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Um, oui, vraiment, uh, l'INRB, donc la RDC, comme uh, vous le savez, la RDC, c'est un continent, c'est un pays qui n'est pas seulement riche en, ma en matière de minéraux stratégiques, mais <rire> également riche en infections, hein, parce que le pays est grand, beaucoup de forêts, beaucoup d'eau, etc., etc. Alors, nous avons développé comme ça, donc, euh, vraiment euh, une expertise pendant 40 ans en ce qui concerne euh, euh, Ebola et également une vingtaine d'années en ce qui concerne le, le monkeypox et nous partageons cette expérience avec euh, nos, nos, nos pays, euh, nos voisins, euh, les pays de la sous-région et euh, vous parlez de la formation, j'étais venu au Grand Bassam euh, pour justement euh, transmettre donc le message à nos collègues de la Côte d'Ivoire et maintenant l'INRB euh, est, est reconnu comme un centre de séquençage et nous formons également des chercheurs et des techniciens en matière de séquençage de monkeypox et de Ebola. Cela se fait donc maintenant d'une façon vraiment régulière, financée par la JICA, coopération japonaise, et l'Afrique le, le, le CDC et l'OMS. Voilà. Alors, en ce qui concerne le suivi des contacts... Il faut que je traduise ça parce que je vais tout oublier. Oh. Um, so, so... Um, you said that you uh, you have uh, a lot of resources, including a lot of infections, mm -hmm. and uh, you've been uh, doing some um, genomics, uh, well, sequencing, and a lot of research and on on sequencing and funded by JICA, you mentioned, yeah. and uh, Africa CDC and Africa CDC and, and, and WHO, now, WHO and WHO, and now you're going to speak about contacts uh, yeah, tracing about contact. So I think my uh, colleague will. Uh, Merci beaucoup, professeur. Euh, en ce qui concerne la gestion des cas, surtout pour euh, les enfants dans les milieux ruraux, comme a dit le professeur, notre pays, c'est un pays continent avec euh, beaucoup de défis, surtout en termes de gestion des cas. Alors, pour faire simple, le, les principes voudraient que les cas soient isolés. Et surtout quand c'est dans un milieu hospitalier, on, les, les malades sont isolés. Mais dans, dans, au niveau, dans, à domicile, les malades également, on préconise l'isolement des malades et on, sait, on, on essaye d'expliquer de, à la communauté donc, les, les, un travail psychosocial est fait pour qu'on on, on soit en mesure de couper la chaîne de transmission en évitant de mélanger le malade avec le, déjà les enfants et aussi avec les personnes je crois dans ma présentation, j'ai fait une illustration pour expliquer euh, cette persistance des de, 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 de cas peut-être chez nous, c'est dit à la promiscuité. Donc les problèmes de promiscuité liés à, à, à ces manques de, de respect strict de, de l'isolement des malades reste et demeure un défi pour nous. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to the next uh, session, just I will um, uh, translate so it's a lot about isolating patients in special wards because it's a human to human transmission. So the best thing is to prevent transmission by providing uh, isolation and isolating uh, patients. We can come back to this discussion uh, after uh, we have heard from our next speaker who has been very patient online. And I will ask Dr. Ogutu to take over on this with no translation needed anymore. Right, thank you very much. and. Uh... As all of us must be aware that some of these things cannot be done without risks that some people take, and this basically the risk that some people take to fund some of these activities. And with this, then, I'll introduce our next speaker just to help us understand some of the thoughts they have. And this is Veronica von Messen from the German Ministry of Federal, German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, who has been funding some of the last activities in West Africa and also provided the seed funding for the setup of Panther to possibly welcome, come and give us what they see and why they're interested in this landscape.
Well, it's my great pleasure to um, be at the meeting today, even though uh, only virtually, and uh, to discuss a bit uh, the perspective that funders, especially sovereign funders, have when we look at this developing and, and, and fast-moving landscape. So the, the funding for Panther is a great example for what we think is, is, is no regret funding. As its first funder, we supported the idea to establish a sound basis um, for preparedness in inter-crisis periods. And I guess a lot of the discussions that we heard earlier today were addressing exactly this point. And that can happen either by capacity development, but also by sustainment of research staff and infrastructures. No regret funding also means to keep the use of funds flexible and allow the possibility to adapt the research plan dynamically in times of crisis. So um, in the next few minutes, I would like to highlight uh, what has already worked well for us as a governmental funder in terms of pandemic preparedness and response and why it has worked from our perspective. So long-term uh, funding initiatives uh, that go through our ministry, such as the European Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnerships, many of you know very well, EDCDP, or the Product Development Partnerships, the PDPs, and also the Research Networks for Health Innovation in Sub-Saharan Africa, called RISA, have been proven to be hugely useful. Although not initially planned for, all these initiatives in their own way have been uh, prepared to conduct research during uh, public health emergencies. And because of this unique position, they had placed themselves before the pandemic. They, they were able to contribute, I think, way above their um, original size or, or mandate. So I'd like to briefly look at the African-American initiative RISA in more detail to uh, give you a concrete example uh, to the elements that may or that we think have contributed to the success. So from the conception on, the priorities have been aligned with local priorities. And compared to many other programs, we implemented a rather unique feature. All networks run under African leadership. So we have a very high level of um, buy-in by the, by the partners. Furthermore, transferring research and development results into the local health systems and building research capacity were key aspects in the initiative. So that were criteria that were used to select um, the, during the funding selection process. When setting up the project in 2016, we really didn't think of, of a pandemic, not, not the least a pandemic like COVID at all. When then it then hit on 2020, the five networks were at an advanced point of their research already. They had established these capacities, not only for doing research, but also for research administration. And that allowed us to quickly react with top-up funding for COVID-related uh, activities. That's just, just right that, this, this ability to, um, to mobilize top-up funding for already established research structures is another example of no regret funding from our perspective. We had similar no regret experiences with EDCTP and product development partnerships Two consortia funded with EDCTP on epidemic preparedness were able to focus on COVID-19 as soon as the pandemic hit. And some PDPs were able to set up additional COVID-19 programs quickly based on their expertise and the existing infrastructure. Um, we believe that long-term capacity strengthening for a robust research environment and a resilient public health system, as well as collaboration and cooperation at eye level, particularly in low and middle income countries, are central elements for a global pandemic preparedness and response. Continuous investment in national and international initiatives, even before a pandemic, underline the importance of acting not only in times of crisis, but also in between. An important question for us as funders is, how can a swift and efficient funding ensure uh, be ensured when a crisis actually occurs. And again, cooperation and collaboration are the key. 
for research funders like us, the global research collaboration for infectious disease preparedness, and you know this probably by its uh, abbreviation, GLOPID R, has been playing an important role in promoting the dialogue across funders on research priorities and upcoming calls for emerging infections. As part of its post-crisis work, funders and clinical networks elaborated a set of recommendations for clinical trial coordination. The three goals are to support epidemic ready clinical trial networks and platforms. To facilitate an agile and effective response and to promote an equitable research environment. Panther is reflecting many of the principles worked out by this group. And this is why we are excited to support this initiative. Being prepared and acting in an coordinated way is essential. At the same time, we must be careful that research does not suffer from overregulation of processes. So sufficient flexibility is equally essential to respond efficiently to different health, political, and socioeconomic contexts. So at the end, allow me to give us all some food for thought and further discussion. Although BMBF is already investing in long-term initiatives, they are, still pro they are still program based and they will remain program based, which means they have a certain lifetime. Ultimately, our success is measured by impact that this impact should not rely on the program based funding. Ultimately, investments in research, the translation into the healthcare systems and the uptake by the communities need to be driven locally. Thus, impact has to be generated by the people involved. We need to raise the question how our funding will be sustainable once certain programs end. Are the systems and processes on site prepared to take over responsibilities and standalone ownership? What does it need to be sustainable? Probably no one has an answer, neither today nor in any near time in the future, but there should be a discussion about this point uh, as we go along with these, pro with these programs. If our efforts yield sustainable results, I would rank that as the best return on investment and as such a funding regret. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to an exciting discussion. Thank you very much. And it is a pleasure to see how to de-risk research in difficult circumstances as Veronica has possibly espoused during this brief presentation and I think does can see what it happens and the flexibility that is needed. And I think this is where the issue of regulation and flexibility and achieving the aims of what you need to do in, during a pandemic becomes quite critical. And that's what we possibly want to see going on. How do we bridge the gap and make sure that we stay in line, but also remain nimble and flexible as we work around this landscape and that's the problem Panther has to deal with and ensure that there's sustainability and adaptation to the findings into the health systems of the various countries where we'll be doing our work. And I think that's why we have to be on the steering, not somebody else at the country level to make sure that what we gain gets translated into health system functions that will provide that health that we need for the population. With that, I think we now are open to discussions and I know there might have been some burning questions that possibly people want to put across. And it's your time now. I think guys online are not sending any more questions, so if anybody needs some clarification made and possibly see we still have the speakers with us.
Hello, uh, I'm Hanzhi. I'm a visiting scholar in Geneva Grad Institute. So my question is, I, I, I feel today's uh, discussion is fantastic, but I'm also thinking about, because I also attend in other side events, and there are a lot of discussion that global health now is too disease-focused, but it's uh, many, many experts talking about global health must be more systematic, focused, driven. And But my, my, but my own thinking is, I, I, my, my, my feeling is this too is so important, right? So both are important. But my question is how, just like uh, the last professor mentioned about, how to make these two kind of approach? They, they can work together. So, so um, yeah, so, so how to make this kind of uh, disease-focused uh, uh, global of, uh, efforts can work just together with it? Different governments that they have on their agenda. That how to how to make your efforts um, better co converged with different countries' agenda. So this is basically this is just for some feeling and some comments. Thank you. Well, maybe I can I can start answering. <laughs> um, there is a, from a, from from. A research funding perspective, um, it is ex exactly what you say. It is important that it all fits together, and you achieve that when you when we think about funding calls by um, planning the calls in a way that the consortia that form are well integrated in the plans of the local and regional and national um, plans for um, health research development. Does this always succeed? No. But it clearly seems that this is a good way to in the right direction. And I think this is also we have to have an expectation management. So it's it, not everything will work the first time around, uh, like anywhere else. And so we have to go step by step and learn from the successes and the and the failures and to 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 move forward in this endeavor, because it is a it is a huge challenge. Thank you. And maybe I can add some words. Um, I think it's a full time job to make sure that we all work together. I mean, it's my full-time job. Um, it's, it's a daily challenge, and, but when it's, when it's a success, it's, it's, really, it's really nice to work in this context. And I would say that it's based on, on trust uh, between all organizations, between the government. We, we need to involve the government. We need to involve the regulatory agency. We need to involve the researcher. We need to involve the community, the patient. And if we succeed to put everyone on the ta same table, it's work. If we do not, you just don't continue your, your project. So it, it's a challenge, but it works. And then maybe if I can add, before um, Ebola, um, pre-submissions did never happened in Africa. I mean, we didn't have anything like a pre-submission meeting. You submitted your application when you're done with it. But since Ebola, now you can actually come and speak to the regulator about what you want to do. Um, in AVRIF, you have the sponsor and the regulator and the ethics sitting at the table and talking about what they want to do. So things have actually moved. Um, pandemics have taught, taught us, or emergencies have taught us to work in a different way um, towards ensuring that we do what is best for the patient. So systems have changed, all looking at the patient at the end and making sure that the patient gets the best out of the, what we want to do. So I think we are all changing. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Thank you very much. I, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. Uh, my name is Suri Moon. I'm co-director of the Global Health Center here at the Graduate Institute. Um, and I want to congratulate uh, everyone and, and Panther for the excellent presentations. I think in many ways we heard a very optimistic and uh, encouraging set of presentations that show how much uh, important research and development is happening uh, in, in many different parts of the world, how much uh, researchers are collaborating with each other in a way that we um, did not necessarily see in, in COVID-19. Uh, very encouraging, and, and the efforts to build uh, long-term infrastructure and capacity on funding, I think, is also very, um, very encouraging. However, 
We also heard about, I think, if I understood correctly, 12 vials of Tecomiramat in, in Brazil. Um, and of course, we heard a number of presentations about MPOX. Um, uh, and I think many people are aware that access to the vaccine supply that was available uh, globally, the, the smallpox vaccine supply was highly inequitable, just as it was for, for COVID-19. And so my question for, um, primarily for the, the government people and the government funders, which is of course uh, Dr. Van Messling, but also uh, Dr. Ogutu in a way, um, as we have more government funding of R&D from Germany, but also across Sub-Saharan Africa and Brazil and other places, is it useful for governments to actually tie more conditions to their research funding so that situations like we see today with a uh, with, uh, vaccine for MPOX um, or in the future uh, don't keep repeating themselves? Um, and is it, in your view, uh, feasible or beneficial for multiple governments to try to do that together. Uh, and I think as you're both very aware, this is something that is being actively debated in the pandemic treaty negotiations, um, not universally agreed upon yet, certainly, but um, I'm, I'm struck by all of the progress made uh, by the research community, and yet we're still facing some of the same uh, challenges with inequity that, that we've been seeing throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I can give you a brief answer to this complex question. Um, the, the, it is to develop a vaccine or a drug or any type of, of, of medical uh, um, countermeasure is very difficult and usually not successful. So one says that out of 100 candidates, one may, may, may make it and 99 fail. There is a huge worry that if you uh, tie any restrictions to this very fragile process, you will have nothing at the end. So the question is whether burdening the research and development process at the early stages with um, rules and regulations that would only apply if anything is successful is a, is a, is a smart way to ensure equitable access. And I, I think, as you say, there's a lot of discussion about this. Um, our experience as a as a funder in the global north is that there's a lot of research funding that is needed to have a success and the success um, happens if, if there is as little restrictions as possible put on, um, on the researchers. And so um, we would be very hesitant to, to put any type of obligation at the early stage, which doesn't mean that there hasn't been, that there doesn't have to be um, agreements and understandings and rules on how products, once they are developed, can be accessed. But the two things can be separated. And one, one easy way to look at it is first you have to have it, then you can start distributing it. And uh, once we end up with not having it, then nobody wins. So that, that has to be balanced out with the, with the question on how and where do one put, does one put um, the regulations in place to ensure this access that I think everybody wants to have. So thank you. Thank you very much. Unless there's something burning, I know we are running out of time. Oh, could I, could I just quickly have the last question if I may. Thank you. I, I've really enjoyed today's presentation and I, I, I echo Siri's comments. Um, you know, it's really encouraging to hear and optimistic. I had no really, I knew about Panther, but I, I didn't know about their work. So it's been a really interesting session uh, today. So thank you to all the speakers. Um, I was interested, Veronica, I, I love the whole no regret funding. It was something that that, that was I, I'm not really familiar with. And um, the way you described it and the premise behind it being led by, um, you know, the, it's African-led. Um, but you talked about um, an infinite 
because funding, obviously, you can't support these programs infinitely. And there has to be a sustainability mechanism where you say, right, now we stop and we, we, we let you take over. As, how, could you tell us about the experience of that transition from when your funding has stopped to ownership? That, and countries have taken a board to, to maintain the infrastructure perhaps that you've um, committed to over in the time that you've supported the program and, and the continuity after you've stopped your funding um, in those programs? The, the short answer is most of these programs are still in, uh, in a stage where they are receiving funding from our side. Uh, but it, part of the design of the programs is that from the beginning onward, um, this 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 sustainability is being essentially included by design. How well this will work? Let's talk again, maybe in five years, and see where we are at then. But um, so far, uh, to include it from the beginning and to to have people think about it and and include strategies for that from the beginning has already changed the way these programs are running and, and, and the perspective the participants have on the program. Okay, thank you very much. And I uh, really want to thank my speakers that were able to share with us the ideas they had. And also the members that presented themselves to possibly help us listen and discuss some of the issues. And with that, Panda is one of the first initiative that is going to work across Emro and Afro, the blue chain in Africa for the first time. So with that, I'm going to invite the representative of Emro, director to possibly give us closing remarks to this beautiful day that we've had together this afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. The Honorable President of Panther, the CEO, uh, most esteemed panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored, privileged, and delighted to be here today joining you for this wonderful discussion in this great place, Geneva, the Institute, uh, Academic Institution. Uh, I, I, I think the question in front of us today is how to prevent the next pandemic. And there had been lots said about that. I'm glad that Panta has uh, set up this platform for people, especially researchers, to come forward to present their great work done on the ground. I, I think people who are sitting in the capitals doesn't understand the real ground realities. But today, we were exposed and witnessed to the real situation they are facing. And we need to really come together uh, to work hard to support these great researchers who are doing real great work on the ground. Now, today when we are discussing, uh, the Director General WHO, Dr. Tedros, has declared that COVID-19 pandemic and MPOX is no more a public health emergency of international concern, but still cases are being reported. And what is more important during the discussions in the World Health Assembly, which is taking place now, is how to prevent the next pandemic. And what is more important is how much we need to invest on preparedness. So that is the question which came up, prevention of next pandemic and focus more on preparedness. I think we need to really focus on surveillance, surveillance of diseases, maybe it is integrated disease surveillance or vertical, whatever you have at the country's level, we need to make it scale it up, strengthen and robust. Then of course, surveillance at the point of entries and more importantly, the question came up about the lab surveillance. We need to have a strong lab system. We need to have connectivity. And then of course, we need to have the facilities. So today I am here representing the regional director, Eastern Mediterranean region. Um, so let me present to you his statement on closing remarks. I quote, I would first wish to refer to the WHO Eastern Mediterranean region, Vision 2023, which has the strategic objective of uh, addressing the health emergencies 
in addition to expanding universal health coverage, promoting healthier populations, and making WHO transformative changes. In fact, WHO also has its own health emergencies program, which works with countries and partners to prepare for prevent, respond to and recover from all hazards that create health emergencies, including disasters, natural or human-made, disease outbreaks, and conflicts. I also wish to refer to the World Health Assembly Resolution 75.8 in 2022 and EB 152-13 on 2023 discussion, following which WHO held consultations for member states and for non-state actors like these foundations to receive inputs and comments pursuant to the resolution and what improvements are needed in the global clinical trials ecosystem in normal times as well as during public health emergencies of international concern. That is where our focus is much. The outcome of these consultations supported the role of WHO in convening and thus generating research priorities at the global level. WHO's R&D Bluefint has published several documents that support generation of high quality evidence related to epidemic and potentially pandemic pathogens and diseases. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Eastern Mediterranean region had participated in global clinical trials, especially countries of Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Oman, Kuwait, Pakistan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Tunisia. Such participation and commitment helped in developing necessary technical experience and expertise in con conducting such trials among different cadres of healthcare professionals within such countries. Moreover, some member states have developed governance mechanisms for holding such trials, not only under emergencies, but also under normal times as well. In addition, the EMBRO region has at least two primary clinical trial registries, which are linked with WHO's International Clinical Trial Registry Platform, ICTRP, while another two are currently in the works to be included under ICTRP umbrella. In addition, the EMBRO region advisory committee for health research in its meeting convened during May 2022 has recommended further technical capacity building for the conduct of large clinical trials and multi-country studies in the region as capacity for such studies is very limited in several countries of the region. And as such, the WHA resolution 75.8 responds to the needs of the countries. Ladies and gentlemen, WHO EMBRO would like to congratulate Panther for its establishment as a clinical research platform for preparedness and pandemic response, which is in line WHO's vision on addressing health emergencies. We look forward to collaborate with Panther, especially in EMBRO countries located in North Africa in collaboration with research hubs located in different African countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John, for the warm words that we have received from you and from Emro, and we look forward to working together. And with that, I just say thank you very much for being here with us. Panther is quietly roaring, coming your way, sniffing for the virus, and we want to make sure you don't meet the virus. The panther should meet it first. Thank you very much, and have a great afternoon. <laughs>